recording. Okay. Um, Julian. All right, you guys sh should be able to get on without permission. So I think I have all the kinks worked out. Mine was from hell, so I'll start with that. <laughs> Can you guys see me okay? Yeah. So I can't yeah. see anybody, but okay. All right. Let me get some lights here. All right, so I want to start the last unit today, and this shouldn't take long. So uh, after today, if we get everything done, I will just post everything, test and all, and then we can just, we have like eight or nine days to deal with whatever comes up. All right, does that sound good? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Sounds good. So we, we have three tests up already, correct? Yes. All right, so I will post test four today or tomorrow, and then when we finish this unit, I'll post test five. Remember, I'll drop your lowest grade. All right, and then anyone who handed in the chapter two homework, I'll give you some extra points at the end. All right, let's give everyone a minute or two to get logged on. Because I think I changed the email, I changed the meeting address the second time tonight. Zoom was being weird, so, okay. Let me mute. Sorry, my four-year-old's <laughs> playing with his toys. <laughs> well, it's all right. I can mute you if I have to. It's all right. <laughs> no worries. He's in his room, but it's on the other side of the house. <laughs> Listen, kids will be kids. Let them be kids as long as they can. Oh, yeah. He's having fun. I don't care. Okay. Um, let me get rid of everyone. Go faster. Invite. to mute. I'll go slower. Clear out. <clears throat> All right, so if I did this right, um, we should have no problems tonight. I'm not guaranteeing everything. All right, so um, I want to start, uh, this should be Unit 5, Chapter 21 in Tolero. So I want to go on the spiral key. So if we look at these at the bottom, do you guys notice anything about these that are weird? They're different? They look like worms? They look like worms, and these are going to have like corkscrew mechanisms, all right? So these are going to usually get in through your skin or mucous membrane. They're going to rotate in, and if we don't catch them in time, they're going to enter our bloodstream, okay? <clears throat> Can you guys tell me anything about anything that gets into our mucous membranes that's pathogenic that we talked about with immunoglobins? Fungus or, well, spores? Um, well, these aren't spore formers, right? So some of these are going to be actually be able to get rid of IgA, immunoglobin A. They have a way of getting rid of it, all right? So they have uh, they can get in and out without super tagging themselves for the immune system, all right? So they have a way in, uh, cloaked almost in a way, if you want to think of it that way. So these are all gram-negative human pathogens. So let's realize they're pathogens. These can actually cause disease. All right, so these are found in the soil. It says right here, free living saprophobes. All right, remember these are things that can um, digest things in the environment and you know they can bioremediate, but when they get into the human body, if they find us um, acceptable, they'll start reproducing in the body, all right? These are commensals of all of animals, all right? They're not primary pathogens, but they can become pathogenic. So treptonemia, We'll start with that class. So this is what causes syphilis, all right? We're gonna talk about three stages of syphilis, primary, secondary, and tertiary, all right? And when we start talking about um, syphilis, it, you know, it gets into the skin, it causes what's called a chancre, all right? Which is red and inflamed. The issue is it goes away. So you might think, um, you know, it might be just something red or irritating, it goes away. People don't think anything of it. If we don't uh, clear it up then and there, it enters the bloodstream, can cause a major rash, 
All right, the issue with that is the rash goes away. So we think, oh, well, maybe it was just something, you know, I had allergic reaction to something, it goes away. All right, and the problem after that, it becomes tertiary, it starts getting into the nervous system. Once it's in the nervous system, we kind of know already that the nervous system doesn't have um, the immunoglobins and the white blood cells. So we have to, we have to um, start uh, counting on those glial cells or astral cells to take care of it. And usually they get overwhelmed, they can't do it. We talked about uh, leptospiria. Uh, that's usually transmitted by urine um, in the environment, and that you can consume it and not know. And then Borrelia burgdorferi. We'll talk about that causes Lyme disease, and I'm sure we've all heard about that. And we'll talk about some classic signs of that: bullseye rash and things. That um, <clears throat> it doesn't happen in all cases; about 70% of the cases, so it's not clear cut. Are we recording? Yes. Okay. Looks like it. Yeah, I see a red blinking dot. So I'm mm -hmm. going to say yes. Let me check that everyone's in. Nobody need permission. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, we have somebody new joining. Awesome. Mr. Constant has asked me a few times. He's in. That's awesome. Welcome. <clears throat> All right, so the other thing about these is these are corkscrew, all right? So they have this periplasmic space in here and they have like a two nine arrangement. They're gonna start contracting and they're gonna start burrowing into the skin. That's how they enter. All right. <clears throat> okay, so treptonemia, these are thin regular coiled cells, all right? Here's the thing, they live in your oral cavity. So you may be shocked that you may have some form of syphilis in your mouth, kind of gross, right? It, they live in the intestinal tract, perigenial regions of humans and animals, and that's usually how they are transmitted sexually. We may not even know we have it. Pathogens are strict parasites with complex growth media. All right, so this is another one of the things you can't say, uh, you know, Dr. Phil, I think I got this at the toilet seat uh, at Wendy's or whatever. It's not really, you, you had to get it from usually from human to human contact because these are strict parasites. They can't just live on surfaces. They have to go from host to host, all right? Because these require live cells for cultivation. All right, so the other thing is we really can't study these that well unless we have a live cell for them to live in. We can't just grow them in an incubator, right? So Treptoponium palladium, all right, causes syphilis, all right? Human and is the natural host for this. It can be zoonotic, but generally it's human uh, past from person to person. All right. Extremely fastidious all right, and sensitive. So if we remember, fastidious means these have very, very complex growth requirements. They're not that easy to cultivate. They literally have to go from host to host. All right. They can't survive long outside of the host. These are sexually transmitted and transplacental. So when I use the word transplacental, what other word have I used this semester that's the same as that? Uh, the vertical um that's got to be kathleen who is yeah. that yeah yeah <laughs> so, i can't I remember what it was right yes. On. <laughs> <laughs> yes vertical transmission perfect thank you all right so here i want to kind of want to go over the syphilis the stages symptoms diagnosis and control so remember i kind of said it was primary secondary and tertiary, there's three stages. And when it goes to tertiary and the nervous system, that's when we, we hear about people that are older, or you know, if you're working in a nursing home, you might find some patients who seem to have dementia or some kind of um, mental disorder. It's not uncommon that they may have gotten syphilis earlier and had no signs or symptoms. And if it goes to this stage, they can start having neurological weird symptoms, all right? All right, so um, incubation. There's no lesions. Humanoids adhere to the, um, penetrate the epithelium. They multiply and they disseminate. So they enter, they start multiplying, <clears throat> and they spread out. All right, so remember, the next, the next thing they go to is your bloodstream. All right, and I said, you, you got this, and you initially have an appearance of a chancre. We'll see a picture of it um, at the inoculation site. So, you know, if it's a male, it's going to be somewhere on the, you know, male reproductive organ, the penis, it could be on the shaft or, you know, wherever it may have entered. 
Uh, and that can be, you know, let's say it's from a female, it can be from a male, you know, we're not gonna judge people here. Intense, uh, you know, activity in the body, chancre later disappears. So they get this, they have a red chancre, and we'll see this coming up, and it goes away. So they think, oh, well, you know, it was one a big deal. It's gone away, I don't have to worry about it. After the chancre heals, two to eight weeks, this can be from, you know, two weeks to four months, or I'm sorry, two weeks to four weeks. The, the uh, heel chancre, there's a very little scarring. Now these things enter the blood and they have fewer any symptoms. So they think, oh, well, you know, I dodged a bullet, it went away, not a big deal. <clears throat> but now it enters the skin, mucous membranes, right? We get hair loss. Now it's very highly infectious because it's gotten into your body, it's learned to adapt, it's multiplying. They can have fever, your lymph nodes can get swollen. Um, symptoms may persist, persist for months or not at all, all right? It kind of goes into a latency period. So we kind of, nothing really happens. It kind of clears up with the rash and everything because it's in your bloodstream. And then we, we don't think anything of it, it disappears. The problem is here, tertiary, third level. It's variable, it can take up to 20 years. So you could potentially get this in your 40s or 50s um, have no signs and symptoms, nothing's going on, and then we get these neurological, neurological cardiovascular symptoms, GUMAs. Does anybody remember what GUMAs? We talked about them the other day when we were talking about leprosy, globi GUMAs. So these are great big um, festering pockets of these in the body, right? And we'll see this coming up. <clears throat> so that, ladies and gentlemen, is a chancre. All right, when I took microbiology in graduate school, my professor Abrams was obsessed with these. And he literally showed us like five or six of these in a semester. And I raised my hand and I said, Professor Abrams, if you show me one more shanker, I'm out of here. He was obsessed with these. All right, so the spirochetes bind the epithelium, they multiply and it forms a shanker. All right, so somebody might think it was just an abrasion or whatever it is, okay? Fluid from the chancre is highly contagious. These are multiplying, all right? So that if this person were to come in contact with somebody else, either you know some kind of oral or um, mucous membrane, so whether north or south, wherever it happens, these things can get off and they can enter the, the next person because these are transmitted person to person. Remember, these have to have a human host to um, multiply. So, I'm not saying it can't be uh, contagious, but it really has to be, you have to have direct contact with this in most cases. Shankers spontaneously heal as a spirochete, now it moves into the blood. All right, these are gram negative, all right? So do you guys remember anything about gram negative um, endotoxins at all? You don't have to, I'm just trying to get you guys to start thinking about, well, what could be some signs or symptoms? So what if this had LPS, lipopolysaccharides in it? Remember how it caused that intravascular coagulation? Yeah, it goes, you can have toxic shock, right? Yeah, toxic it shock, so it's gonna cause your blood vessels to, it's gonna, you know, if it's in the capillary bed or superficial in the skin, it's gonna cause your blood to coagulate inside the capillary bed. So you're gonna get this rash. It'll be a sign or symptom of this. All right, here it is. Here's secondary syphilis. It's gone from primary to secondary. So it, it's healed, the chancre's healed up. They've had contact with someone else. Hopefully not, but they could have. <clears throat> so now it enters your bloodstream. Spirochetes is multiplying in the bloodstream. Rash forms on the skin, palms, and soles with fever, headache, and sore throat. This is from the endotoxin, right? So this is very superficial. So, you know, some, you know, per, people will think, well, it's just a rash. You know, I was, it's dermatitis. I'm in contact with something that's causing a rash. But literally, this is happening inside your body. And it's very superficial. It's going to your capillary beds. And remember, superficially in your skin, the temperature is a little bit less than deep. So it, it finds more ambient temperature uh, superficially in your skin. The rash disappears spontaneously. The person thinks, oh, well, I, you know, I, maybe I, I, you know, I'm allergic to something I taught, sheets or clothing or whatever. They don't think anything of it. 
Now this is tertiary, so this is the third stage. We missed it at stage one with the chancre. We missed it in stage two with the rash. So now it's gone to stage three. If left untreated, tertiary syphilis forms. <clears throat> Damage to multiple tissues and organs. So remember, this is coagulating <clears throat> your um, capillary bed superficially, but it's gonna start going through your body. It's coagulating blood in the capillary beds and all the um, arterials that are feeding your organs and tissues. All right, so it literally, makes these little mini dams throughout your body. So it's gonna cause damage to anything distal to that, any organ or tissue that needs blood supply. Well, the dam before that's jammed up. So these tissues aren't profuse with oxygen, they can't get any nutrients, so it causes major damage. Gumas may develop, there's, there's gonna be solid things inside of your organs, all right? Now, can you all see the screen? Can you see this person's pupil? Yeah. Yeah, what is, what's the problem with that? The weird shape. It's not round. Yeah, it should be round. <clears throat> Those muscles in the iris should be pulling it. So that diameter should be round, all right? And when you shine a light in one eye, the other one should uh, react the same way. So this is called Robertson Argyle pupil, I think. I think I have this right, all right? It's accommodating, but not responsive, all right? Does it also show those, or cause those three specks that are in there as well? No, that's, that's something for iridology, but yeah. no. These the run here, Robert? Yeah. No, <clears throat> that's, well, if you know anything about iridology, that's indicative of something else. So mm -hmm. like um, reflexology, iridology, these things in your body, you know, if you believe in voodoo, they can tell you other things that are going on in your body. So your feet and your eyes are actually a little roadmap to your body, but that's beyond the scope of the course. All right, <clears throat> so, okay. so this is, uh, can pass through the placenta of the fetus, so vertical transmission. Symptoms include nasal discharge, skin eruptions, bone deformation, and um, nervous system abnormalities, all right. So this is Hutchinson's teeth, I think it's called. All right, so this is a baby, all right? So mom had it. She vertically transmitted it during birth through the birth canal, all right? So what else do you notice besides the really bizarre teeth? Notice anything here in the clock? Is the, the palate really high? Yeah, the, the palate's very high. So usually, like, it's, it's some form of a birth defect, all right? This person probably had, this mother probably also concurrently had a vitamin B9 deficiency or a folic acid deficiency. So during embryology, the first system to develop is a nervous system. So remember when we were talking about bacteria and we talked about the sulfidamides and how they stopped um, PABA and DNA reproduction. So we need folic acid for that, right? You know, we already got tested on that, but I'm just letting you, I'm reminding you again, this can happen. That's why women of childbearing years really need to make sure they're taking full spectrum B vitamins, whether they intend to get pregnant or not. If they do, for some reason, you really want to make sure you have B9 so the nervous system develops properly in that first trimester. Because remember, with women, if they get pregnant, they may not know for a month or two, all right? Just, you know, they might think, I you know, I missed a menstrual cycle with stress or whatever occasionally it can happen. But you want to make sure that if in their first trimester they have um, a full source of folic acid. All right, and B vitamins should actually be taken as a complex. B6 and B9, if you have a deficiency, they can mimic each other uh, very easily. Okay. So syphilis diagnosis and testing. <clears throat> Stages of syphilis can mimic other diseases. So, you know, we saw some of these, you know, the rash, fever, you know, it could be they can mimic other things. They won't think anything of it. Okay. So we're going to just test that um, serological testing with blood um, and uh, antigen antibody complexes are probably the easiest way to do it. You know, if you're interested, we treat it with penicillin G. Even though it's gram negative, this does tend to work on it. <clears throat> All right, so 
Here are some other diseases that are related to them. Genus uh, species is a little bit different. The genus is the same. All right. All right. So these are just some things. Um, these are not really common in this country and other countries are very, very common. All right. Okay, so. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk, the next thing I wanna talk about, uh, leptospiridia and leptospirosis. These are tight, regular individual coil and bend or hook at one end. So these um, are all gonna be spiral rookies. They're gonna curl, right? <clears throat> By flex of these are harmless free living sap ropes. So these really wouldn't find us habitable, hospitable. All right. <clears throat> Interrogons, it sounds like someone's interrogating you, right? That's where that word comes from. So these are literally gonna look like a question mark, all right? So you kind of remember, that's how they named it. Remember with A and P or micro, these names, generally they're gonna, they're gonna give you some key to what they look like or why they named it, like Staph aureus, aureus means jello. So remember, when people are naming this back in the day, <clears throat> whether it's Greek or um, any other language they were naming it, they always named it for some feature. So interrogons means um, question, so it looks like a question mark. Why is my mouse frozen? <clears throat> All right. And I said, this is usually caused by urine. Bacteria shed in the urine. Infection occurs by contact with contaminated urine targets Kidney, liver, brains, and eyes. So I'm just asking you guys, if you saw a case study question or something on this, how would they phrase that? Like, how would this person be in contact with contaminated urine, do you think? Other than, you know, the weird thing where people like to be peed on. That's not it. Because somebody told me that two semesters ago. Well, you know, some people like to get peed on. I'm like, well, that's not it. All right. <laughs> maybe, but maybe not it. Could it be if they're, well, you're, are you looking for the zoonotic one or the one with the humans? Yeah, zoonotic usually or humans. So these are people, you know, generally they're going to say, well, if somebody came up with this, they say, well, where'd you get, you know, where could you possibly have gotten this? They could say, well, I was camping or, you know, they'd be somewhere around an area where animals had urinated or something, right? So these are, here's the thing. These people have sudden high fever, chills, headache, muscle aches, conjunctivus and vomiting. What does that sound like? Everything Hello? else, fever, you know, whatever. So usually these, these go un- noticed or people don't think anything of it right but if we don't get rid of it long-term infections may affect kidneys and liver so if it starts affecting the kidneys or right, remember that's going to it's going to cause major um septicism in the in the blood the, the kidneys aren't able to filter the blood so these people could be, become very very toxic if it starts affecting the liver remember your liver has over 500 different functions so this can be very very damaging in the body. So 50 to 60 cases a year in the US. Right? And the problem with this, like I said, is people don't really even know they have it. And you wouldn't think that you would get, you would contract this camping or something. It would be something so weird that you would never, it wouldn't be something, oh, well, yeah, obviously I got this, whatever. They wouldn't really know. Right? So <clears throat> Borella, Right. So Borrelia burgdorferi causes Lyme disease, Borrelia hermsi. All right. So what I think with this, it has two eyes. Okay. So whenever I see this, when I was studying all this, it has relapsing fever over and over again. All right. I'll get back to that in a second. So these are very large. All right. Borrelia is transmitted by an arthropod vector. So this really has to be carried by something. You have to really be bitten by this. So the arthropod is a vector. It's gonna carry it in the body. As it bites you, it breaches that first and second line of defense and gets into the bloodstream. So it's literally depositing these directly in your bloodstream. So you have no um, skin first line of defense and you really don't really have your mucous membranes as second line of defense. So this is depositing right into your blood and it just starts traveling wherever it's gonna go. 
Herm C has relapse and fever. So do you guys remember we talking about lipto um, or listeriosis yesterday? Do you guys remember anything weird about that or anything cool about that? Other than it, it, it can live in very cold temperatures and at high salt, um, it's not really affected by pH and things. Do you remember anything about how that hides in your body? Doesn't it wait until it has no oxygen? What is was it the no oxygen one where it had to wait until it, it gets, uh, in, uh, it no gets into your monocytes? <laughs> it, we uh, it basically, there's phagocytosis and it basically pulls it in and is, <clears throat> the body thinks it's itself basically. Yep. The other thing, remember this one, this one can also change its antigens. So anyone that has a relapsing fever, so if you, there's a very few, you have it, you have a fever, your body makes antibodies to it. So it starts to get it at bay. And then the organism says, wait a minute, you found antibodies to my antigens on my cell surface. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna change my antigens. So now you have to start the whole process all over again. So when you see anything that has spikes, fever, it goes away, um, you know, like maybe a week or two later, fever goes away. Two weeks later, fever goes away. That's a relapse. So what's happening with that in almost every case is the organism is literally changing its antigen markers on its surface. So your immune system has to keep finding B cells to make antibodies to the new antigens, all right? Very weird, but you know, for the organisms is great. It can, it can evade um, detection and it can it can um, evade death that way. And Borrelia burgdorferi, all right, causes Lyme disease. So there's a few of you on here. So <clears throat> what do you guys know about Lyme disease? Contracted through ticks, leaves a bullseye mark or bullseye rash, mm -hmm. and then usually has to be treated by antibiotics. Yeah, hydrocycline intensive course. All right, <clears throat> but the issue with this is only 50, 60, or 70% have that, right? And if you've ever been bitten by a tick, if you don't check or if they're really tiny, you don't see them. So if you don't get them immediately, um, when they bite, they can, start re they can start just dumping these organisms into your bloodstream. So you wanna uh, get them as soon as possible. <clears throat> All right, Herm C, the relapsing fever, wild mammalian reservoirs, squirrels, chipmunks, right? So these can be in the wild, right? You can get this camping wherever, wherever you're uh, in this environment. Transmitted by ticks. After two to five days, patient has high fever, shakes, chills, headache, and fever. So you don't notice the tick. Uh, two days or two weeks later, you start having a fever. You're not gonna usually relate um, that to a tick bite. You say, oh, I was camping two weeks ago, I don't remember any of this. Or I was hiking two weeks ago or whatever. Nausea, vomiting, muscle aches, abdominal pain, extensive damage to liver, spleen, heart, kidneys, and cranial nerves. Right? So if we don't catch this, it can be very debilitating. And once again, a lot of these, when we start going forward here for the next couple of days, a lot of these diseases are gonna mimic just basic flu. You're gonna have, you know, you could be, even have like a prodromal syndrome and you don't really notice what's going on. It just seems like something you've had before. It doesn't seem that bad. As the parasite changes, the immune system responds, resulting in recurrent relapses, all right? So the parasite literally is changing all its antigen markers on its cell surface. Treated with tetracycline, <clears throat> so that is gonna be one that, remember how it stops that protein synthesis in the ribosomes? Right. And here, once again, if you see relapsing fever, there's only a few, all right? So there you have your primary infection, it reduces your fever, all right? Remember, fever is a good thing. It gets your immune system, it wakes it up, all right? And we're hoping that the increased temperature will slow down the um, microbe or the pathogen if it can. And then the <clears throat> initial antibody response at first reduces the fever. So it kind of goes away, you know, your body is responding to it as it normally should. Infected by mutant borella causes a relapse in fever. So this actually goes in 
and changes its markers, uh, as we see going all along here. And this can last six months to a year. This, this thing's pretty smart. It'll just keep changing it until finally it can't change anymore. And then we hope that our immune system gets rid of all of it. If we don't catch it in time and treat it with tetracycline, it may be um, a very, very lengthy process before we can get rid of it. <clears throat> all right, so I wanna talk a little bit about Lyme's disease. All right, so here's the thing. Usually you're not gonna be infected the first, with these nymphs, not the first season, it's usually the second season as they go into adulthood. And here's the thing, please remember, we are an incidental host. What do you think that means? Right, we're not their primary, like they primarily don't want us, we just happen to be walking through the woods and the tick says, oh wait, and it jumps on and digs into your skin. It really wants the deer, right? So it has a complex life cycle involving mice and deer and transmission of ticks, right? So a lot of times people think, well, it just goes from deer to deer to deer, all right? Not usually what happens. So the adult is leaving larvae, all right? The larvae jumps on the mouse, right? I'm gonna ask you guys, just so you kind of remember, why would the, this little tiny larvae jump on a mouse? Because it's closer to the ground where the tick Perfect. lives. Yeah, it's closer to the ground, they're burying in the ground, so they're gonna come in more contact with grass, all right? <clears throat> Mouse infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, infected larval tick, and you see it's getting larger, it's just feeding off the mouse, all right? And here's the thing, the mouse is not even affected by this, all right? Yeah. In the second year, the larvae mold into a nymph, into an aggressive feeding stage. So these things are bigger, now they're hungry because they want to grow bigger and they want to reproduce, that's what they do. We just happen to be an incidental host, an accidental host. It just jumped on us, all right? all right? The nymph takes blood uh, from a number of hosts, including deer and humans. It really prefers the deer. All right? On the deer, the nymph matures into an adult male and female ticks, all right? and they mate, and then they mate, and then they leave the larvae, and the whole process starts again here, first year on the mouse, second year it jumps on us. Why does it affect the deer? Because the deer are in the woods, you know, because the deer are, they're usually going to be in uh, proximity to the ticks for a longer period. Of them. You know, most of us, you know, live in homes and whatever. The deer live right in the... Uh, no, I know that. I know that. I'm like saying, like, why doesn't it affect the deer, like, with Lyme disease? Um, because um, it doesn't, like, our, um, it's zoonotic, so it doesn't affect the deer because their epigenetics are different than ours. Like their genetics are different. Mm -hmm. Just like, I um, can't think of a, there's a few diseases uh, like Yersinia pestis, the black death. It doesn't really affect the flea that transmitted it. It just it happens to affect us because our um, epigenetics, our immune system can't get rid of the deer has a much, um, their immune system is able to, oops, sorry, take care of the tick better than we can. I'm not saying in a few uh, decades or in a hundred years, we're not going to evolve to be able to take care of that. But right now, the deer have evolved over millennia to deal with this. Right. Yeah, because I've shot a deer, had ticks on it, and oh, ate it, and was fine, you know? Well, you know what? We, I shouldn't tell you this story, but we had an instructor here about three years ago when um, PETA was crazy about cats and everything, and they, you know, they were protesting everything, so we couldn't get cats from this country. You know, we had to import them from Mexico or whatever, and they were really rare, and I had to find a bunch of different vendors to get me them. And we had an instructor here who found two cats that had ticks, so he wanted me to autoclave the text and he threw the cats out. And I'm like, well, you know, Professor, whoever I won't name him because he wasn't the brightest ball. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I said, uh, you know, why should the, the cats away? He goes, well, they were infected with ticks. I said, well, were the ticks alive? He's like, no. I said, was the cat alive? Nope. Was it in formaldehyde for three years? Yep. I go, okay. 
So you really thought there'd be a pathogenic transmission of Bordella burgdorferi? He's like, oh, good point. But anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Just, sometimes I'm like, what? So anyway, it's acquired by tick bites, non-fatal, slow progressive syndrome that mimics neuromuscular and rheumatoid conditions. So when this first started in Lyme, Connecticut, all right, so this was, you know, decades ago, was primarily women, and they would have fibromyalgia, they have all these uh, joint conditions, they'd have these weird fevers, they'd have neurological tics and weird things, and no one could figure out what it was. And literally, the story goes that a bunch of women in the area actually researched this aggressively, and they figured it out. Right? So, you know, a lot of them had these symptoms, and they were so vague and weird that no one could figure out what it was, no one could give them a, de a definitive diagnosis. And remember, if you're going into healthcare, you know, patients just want to know what's wrong with them. Like, just tell me exactly what's wrong. I'll deal with whatever it is, but just tell, tell me it is, um, um, idiogen what's the word when it's, um, I can't think of the word right now. Something eugenic. Well, well, we don't have any idea what it is. Like, don't tell me you don't know what it is. Just tell me what it is and I'll deal with it. So like I said, 50 to 70% get this bullseye rash, right? And that's pretty prominent. You can't miss that, right? Fever, headache, stiff neck, and dizziness. Sounds like the fever of the flu, right? If untreated, it can progress to cardiac and neurological symptoms and polyarthritis. So like a lot of joints, it spreads and it affects a lot of joints. Very, very painful. Treated with... Um, tetracycline and amoxicillin. <clears throat> All right, so those are the spirochetes. So these are very, very corkscrew um, shaped. They burrow in. The next ones we're gonna talk about are curviform. All right, so these, we talked about cocci, we talked about um, rods, coxobacilli, we talked about bacillus and how weird shape that is. These are going to be curviform. So they could look like a comma, they could look like a seagull, they could, they're um, curved, so they're curviform. These are also gram negative, generally cause enteric diseases. So the minute I say that, what are you thinking? Stomach? GI, yeah. Yeah, G stomach or GI tract. All right, stomach is going to be the heliobacter. So um, vibrio, cholera vibrio. Right, so they're comma-shaped rods, single polar flagellum. So remember, these things can move. They've got a little um, outboard motor on them. They can move. Right? They can do a run or tumble. Remember how they can go forward or backward depending on what's uh, in their environment. Campylobacter <clears throat> is short spiral curved rods with one flagellum. They can also move. So this is gonna cause some um, GI discomfort, all right? Heliobacter is a spirochete with tight spirals and sev several polar flagella. Right, so this can move very, very fast. So what do you guys know about, well, what if I said H. pylori? Ulcers? Yeah, Helobacter pylori causes ulcers and we're gonna find out that Helobacter pylori can actually live in a very um, low pH, very acidic environment. And the thing about this is it actually induces, or it actually produces bicarbonate, all right, to raise that pH a little bit. Other, these other ones can't, all right. So remember the stomach pH should be around two, three. This here will actually release bicarbonate which is very basic. So it could take the pH in its environment from a three to a four or from a four to a five. So it makes it a little bit more hospitable for it. It has that little niche market where it can do that, other ones can't. So this guy's like, well, I'm the only one that can live in the stomach, so I don't have any competition. It starts causing damage to the stomach lining and if it burrows deeper and deeper, it can cause some major, major issues. All right, so let's talk about a little Vibrio cholera. You guys heard anything about cholera? Isn't that like one of those old-timey diseases? 
Well, it was, you know, day of cholera. It was old time. And before we knew a lot about it, this is transmitted by water. So people would get sick with this. And with a lot of these, you can flush them out if you, if you hydrate enough and you can just kind of flush them out. But the problem back in the day was, you know, it was very prevalent in other countries, China. They would get this from the well or wherever, they get it, they get sick and they drink more water to flush it out as they normally should. But they were reinfecting themselves with the same water that gave it to them. Right? So this is comma shaped bacteria is ingested in food or water. And this can be, uh, they got it from water, um, they had diarrhea, and it was under their fingernails or on their fingers, and they reinfect food or whatever. They're making food for their family or whatever. They're eating something. They're reinfecting their oral cavity with the same thing that came out of opening number two. Okay. So the El Toro type survives longer. It's more infectious. All right, just so you've heard it, um, not testable in my opinion, but infects mucus barrier of small intestines. All right, it's not invasive. So if I say it's not invasive, what does that mean to you guys? All right, so non-invasive means it's not gonna actually breach your um, enteric wall. So it's kind of hangs out in the GI tract. Right? It's non-invasive. It likes your GI tract. Right? It affects your mucus barrier of the small intestines, non-invasive. So actually attach, it sends out chemical signals is gonna cause your um, electrolytes to leave your cells. All right, as they leave your cells, remember, water always follows salt. So if I can get some Na plus to leave your uh, intestinal cells, water is gonna follow. All right, so it causes a lot of dehydration. It causes your um, intestinal contents to become very, very watery. Releases cholera toxin that causes electrolytes and water loss through secretory diarrhea. So when we talk about secretory diarrhea, here I'm coming up, that just means secretions is gonna cause very, very watery diarrhea. So whenever you see rice, water, stool, so these people have stool, it's very, very watery, and it looks like little flecks of rice in there, okay? So when you see that, what's happening is it's, it's the, even though it's non-invasive, it damages that cell or the microvilli. They start shedding off. And when you see it in the feces or the diarrhea, it looks like little specks of rice. Right? Resulting in dehydration leads to muscle, circuitry, and neurological symptoms. So you're dehydrated, so you don't have enough water. So everything's going to be affected even your brain cells. So remember, if you are dehydrated, remember there's dehydration is 2% of water loss is mild, 4% is moderate, 6% is severe dehydration, right? And 8% is toe tag death. So remember, when you're losing all that water, when your cells get dehydrated, they don't function nearly as well. Rehydrate and treat with tetracycline if you need to. And a lot of these, uh, luckily, you just keep rehydrating with, with fresh water and we can flush this thing out because it's non-invasive. It doesn't literally attach with fimbrae and things like that. So we can flush it out if we need to. So if you guys wanna review that, just showing you this thing has a uh, flagella. It's gonna dock here, secretes that toxin. It's gonna cause these cyclic amp pumps and everything to happen, and it starts flushing out all of your bicarbonate and your sodium. And remember, water always follows sodium, so everything in here gets dehydrated. When these cells dehydrate, we have to pull water or plasma from somewhere else. All right, so we're pulling plasma from the blood to rehydrate these cells. All right, so every other cell in the body is going to be dehydrated too because we're pulling all that plasma so your entire blood supply becomes um you have less volume so everything gets affected by this all right so i'll talk about some of these other vibrio vibrio cholera is probably the most um common or the one that you're going to hear about the most all right 
But if we're talking about something that's salt tolerant, all right, so these can live in a higher salt concentration. It's gonna be in coastal waters. These are associated with marine invertebrates. You're gonna get this from eating something in salt water. So Vibria para -hema, uh, hemolyticus. All right, so hemolyticus, when you see lytic or lice, what do you think that means? You start cleaving, it's gonna start damaging cells. So this is gastroenteritis, inflammation of the gastrointestinal um, system from raw seafood. Symptoms are very similar to cholera. So you know, somebody might contract this if they're uh, on the east or west coast and they're, you know, they think they're cool and they're gonna start eating raw um, clams or oysters. All right, you can get this if the organism is infested with cholera. So the cholera would be in the area, they're gonna consume it as they run that um, salt water through their um, system. Vibrio uh, vinificus, gastrointestinal from raw oysters. Serious complications in persons with diabetes or liver disease, they're gonna be slightly immune compromised. So if you see Vibrio, anything else in the future, if it's not cholera, Remember, it's going to be from something in the seawater. It's going to be very salt tolerant. Vibria cholera can't live in this higher salt concentration. That's why it's more common because most people drink um, fresh water or they're um, going to be more exposed to fresh water as opposed to salt water. No one's going to be drinking salt water purposely. They're going to be consuming something that lives in the salt water. Okay. So treatment with this, we want to just... Uh, fluid and electrolyte replacement, occasional antimicrobials if we need to. All right, let's talk a little bit about Campylobacter. All right. So the difference with these is, all right, these are more S-shaped or gall-winged if you look. All right. You can see it's kind of a gall-winged. Right. These have polar flagella, so they're on each end. These are slender curved or spiral bacilli, often S-shaped or gall wing pairs, polar flagella. All right, <clears throat> here's the issue. These are common residents of the intestinal tract, genital ureal tract. All right, so these can be intestinal tract, um, genital ureal tract, or the oral cavities of birds and mammals. So we'll talk about uh, Campylobacter jejunum. Jejuni is going to live in the jejunum. So, does anybody know what portion of the small intestine the jejunum is? All right. So, is it uh, proximal or distal? All right. It's more distal. All right. In Campylobacter uh, fetus or fetalis, or right, usually this is going to uh, um, be more uh, pathogenic for a fetus more deadly. So Campylobacter jejunum or jejuni, important cause of bacterial gastroenteritis, transmitted by beverages or food, just like cholera, right? reaches the mucus at the last segment of the intestines near the colon. So this is the last portion of the colon where it likes to live. All right, and that could have a lot to do with the oxygen concentration. Remember, we talked about um, Australian difficile living in the large intestine where it was very anaerobic, uh, almost no oxygen. This lives at the very, very end where the oxygen concentration is a little bit less than the duodenum or the more proximal areas. Reaches the mucosa at the last segment of the small intestines near the colon. Now, <clears throat> here's the difference. These adhere, burrow through the mucus, and multiply. So these are invasive. Cholera is not. Cholera will attach, release that toxin. The juni is going to be, um, it's going to adhere, literally attach, and then it wants to burrow in. Heat labeled endotoxin stimulates a secretory diarrhea like that of cholera. So remember, I said secretory is going to be very, very watery mucus. All right, it's causing the secretory toxin is going to cause those electrolytes to leave. Uh, sodium, the fluid from the cell is going to leave too, all right? But here's the difference. This is invasive. So what do you think we're going to add to that? It's going to invade tissue. So it's going to invade tissue. It's going to damage those cells. 
to remember, we have symptoms, headache, fever, abdominal pain, bloody and watery diarrhea. So the difference with this is it lives in the distal end. It's invasive, so we're gonna cause some tissue damage. So generally we're gonna have a little bit of blood in that, right? And remember, this is towards the end of the intestine. <clears throat> so um, does everyone here know the difference between occult or frank blood? The digestive system, okay. Wouldn't. All right. I want to hear what you have, what you have to say, and we'll we'll figure it out. Wouldn't a cult be in the stool <clears throat> while the other one? I don't know. It is a cult is hidden. You can't see it, but Frank, you can see it, right? All right. So a cult means hidden. Perfect. Exactly what I was going to say. So a cult. If you have a cult blood, it's going to be dark uh, and tarry. Right? So if it's a cult, it usually means it's more proximal. So that's going to be a bleed <clears throat> in the stomach, or the duodenum, or the first part of the small intestine. So as it travels along, your protein, your digestive enzymes are going to start digesting that blood. It's going to turn dark. It's going to be uh, denser. So it's going to be like a tarry stool. All right, frank means, you know, I'm going to be frank with him, be open. So frank blood or frank, frank stool is much redder, right? So this is going to generally have the bloody diarrhea is going to be more frank. It's going to be um, redder. It's not going to be a cult, right? I know it's not part of the course, but, you know, I might as well let you guys, have you guys start thinking about these things. All right, treatment of rehydration, electrolyte balance therapy. All right, with this. Campylobacter fetus or fatalis, <clears throat> opportunistic pathogen that affects debilitated persons or women late in pregnancy. All right, so late in pregnancy, they get it um, towards the end of their pregnancy. Or, you know, pregnant women, they, you know, they're carrying around the baby. So their immune system is, is already slightly taxed. Because so this can cause meningitis, pneumonia, arthritis, septicemia in a newborn. So if the newborn gets this, all right, it can become very septic in the system because it's, gonna, it's going to invade the digestive tract of the infant. They don't really have a, a great immune system. So if this is able to burrow uh, past the basement member and get into their capillary supply, it can become systemic. Right? I know I'm giving you guys a lot, but I want you to start thinking about, um, you know, the pathology or the pathogenesis of all these diseases. Now, Helobacter H. pylori, right? it's a gastric path pathogen. Curved cells discovered in 1979 in stomach of, of biopsied specimens. <clears throat> so if you guys don't know the story behind this, you know, they used to think that ulcers were typically men, uh, type A, high stress, they might, you know, drink a lot or smoke a lot. They were thinking type A personality because they were um, constantly stressed. They thought, well, they're just releasing a lot of stomach acid. Uh, the mucus barrier can't really deal with that. So the stomach acid is burrowing through their mucous membrane into their skin, All right, which may have been true for some of them. <clears throat> but the doctors who discovered this said, well, no, we found H. pylori in the majority of these biopsy um, cadavers, and we're telling you it's from H. pylori because they can live in this low acid uh, environment. And these guys were laughed at, and they said, you know, go, you're nuts, we're gonna take your license away, you're a quack. So these guys were like, okay, whatever. So I can't think of the name of the doctor or his assistant. They literally swallowed a beaker full of this, both of them, and they inoculated themselves with this and kind of proved it. And guess what they got for all this? Nobel Prize? The Nobel Peace Prize, nice job, yes. All right, so it causes 90% of stomach and duodenal ulcers, apparent cofactor in stomach cancer. So remember, we're burrowing in there, it's pathogenic, the, the stomach has to keep regenerating that over and over again. So we have a high, very high mitotic rate, we've got damaged tissue, so we're increasing the chances of genetic mutation by having this constantly um, fixing itself, all right? Here's the other really cool thing. People with type O blood, 
have a 1.5 to 2% higher rate of ulcers, all right? And the other thing that I'm gonna let you guys know, um, and there's many articles on this, people with type O blood are generally bit more by mosquitoes, more by bees, or any of these hymen um, insect vectors, all right? We don't know why, all right? Because usually we think that these organisms are attracted to the carbon dioxide we're exhaling, but there's all kinds of um, articles on people with O-type blood being bit or having other um, susceptibility to other things, all right? And here at the bottom, I have this in purple here for you, produces urease, which converts urea into ammonium and bicarbonate. So this organism is able to produce bicarbonate, all right? And remember, bicarbonate is uh, very, very basic. So this organism, where it's resting here, is able to excrete this urease. It converts urea uh, into ammonium and bicarbonate. It is able to literally change the pH in its environment to help it thrive. All right, so it's kind of cool. All right. All right, let's talk about some other rickettsia. Talk about uh, rickettsia rickettsii, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Talk about my friend chlamydia and then some mycoplasms. All right, so these are unrelated to each other but similar in morphology, shape, or pathogenesis, or like what they cause. All of them are atypical. Remember, I said before that a lot of these genus and species, we try to group them together by um, how related they are uh, genetically with DNA, um, but at some point in time, we can't really fit them into a class. So these are something that's unique or we kind of put them at the end like we can't classify them exactly but there's some similarities we're going to group them together for you right so atypical which are not normal bacterial pathogens so these really don't fit an entire pattern we can't just group them with like gram negative rods or gram positive cocci or whatever so the family of rickettsia rickettsii all right or rickettsiae rickettsiaceae is how you pronounce it these are intracellular pathogens that rely on an arthropod vector. So the Rickettsiaceae, these have to live in parasite to parasite. So these are passed from vector to vector. We just happen to be a bi biological host for, um, you know, whatever. Um, they rely on some kind of uh, arthropod vector to transmit them back and forth. All right. Uh, Chlamydiaceae are intracellular pathogens that alternate between elementary and bacterial bodies. So we're going to see with chlamydia, you're going to you infect someone. One part of the cell goes into the body, it reproduces and it comes out as a different shape. Right. All right. And the mycoplasms lack a cell wall, and these are highly pleomorphic. So this is another one of those organisms that literally. Uh, will attach to whatever and it takes on the shape of whatever attached. It doesn't have a cell wall, so it doesn't really have a structure. It's more like a, a glob or um, not like silly putty, but if you throw it against something or it touches something, it literally takes on the shape of whatever it's up against, right? So the Rickettsia genus, all right, these are small obligate intracellular parasites. So remember, these can't really. Um, live on surfaces that well. They're obligate, and so they have to go from cell to cell. The gram-negative cell wall, right? non-motile, pleomorphic rods or coxobacilli, shape-wise. <clears throat> so t uh, ticks, fleas, lice are involved in their life cycle. They have to have some kind of arthropod to live in, and then they're transmitted to us via uh, tick bite, flea bite, lice, right? Bacteria enter the endothelial cells, right? So remember, endothelial <clears throat> cells are cause necro necrosis of the vascular lining, vasculitis, vascular leakage, and thrombosis. So this is gonna enter your bloodstream in capillary bed or something. <clears throat> All right, so what do you think is causing inflammation of the vascular, um, necrosis, leakage, or thrombosis. Or would that be the red blood cells being laced? <clears throat> yeah, it's gonna cause, it's, you know, it's gonna release some kind of toxin. It's gonna cause the um, red blood cells to lice or clump, all right, intravascular coagulation. All right, so 
All right, so uh, Rickettsia, Rickettsii. All right, so just so we know, it's a double name. Rickettsia, Rickettsii causes Rocky Mounted or Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. All right, so when we look at that rash, you're going to say, well, my God, this person has Patechiae all over their body. Remember, that's because these are ending the endothelial cells. They're causing death of the vascular line. They're causing the platelets and the, the red blood cells to start clotting inside of the capillary bed. And the capillary bed that's superficial that we can see, they have all these little specks. So uh, Patechiae are little tiny pinpoint um, coagulations in the capillary bed. Very, very indicative of intravascular coagulation. <clears throat> so endemic typhus, right? Prozaki is caused by lice. Starts with a high fever, chills, headache, rash. All right. So very similar to flu or whatever. These, you know, these things you can have them, uh, and people don't know exactly what it is. But you know, just remember typhus uh, endemic is usually caused by lice. All right. Or epidemic is caused by lice. Endemic. Um, is harbored by mice and rats, occurs sporadically in areas of high flea infestation and milder symptoms. All right, so when you, you see typhus, uh, they're gonna ask you, transmission is gonna be lice or uh, fleas. Just kind of remember typhus, oh wait a minute, that's not like a, um, a tick, it's gonna be more like um, a lice or flea type thing. Right? And then Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, see this question very, very often. Rickettsia, Rickettsii, so it's a double name. Zoonosis carried by dog or wood tick. So it's very, very specific, all right? Most cases in the southeast are on the eastern seaboard. Distinct spotted rash may damage heart and central nervous system because of that intravascular coagulation. All right, so if they ever give you a case study and somebody is in the Rocky Mountains in the West Coast, it's not gonna be this, all right? This is gonna be more our area, east coast, all right, either northeast or southeast, these are carried by dog or wood ticks, all right. Okay, let me skip that last one, not important. All right, <clears throat> all right so Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, Rickettsia rickettsii is transmitted to humans through tick bite and most common rickettsial infection in North America. All right, so if they really give you this, Unless they specify it's a dog tick, um, it's always going to be, they're going to give you a region right, where it's very, very common. And that's what it looks like. All right. So you probably can't miss that. That's probably a pretty moderate severe case. But, you know, like I said, a lot of these right now, the first symptoms are fever, chills, headache, and a spot of rash. And this disappears a couple of days later. So this person, you know, you could say, well, let's say they got bit on the, the right hand here and they just have the rash on their right arm. And it's very, very distant when it goes away in a few days. Well, they're not going to think anything of it. They're going to say, oh, well, I was probably, you know, weeding or I brushed against something and had this rash. Right? But if we don't catch it in time, this will start spreading in the bloodstream. It can start damaging uh, organs deeper or other parts of the body. Central nervous system can become involved and fatality rates are 20% if untreated. So this is usually transmitted by milk. Usually they give you that feces or milk is generally what they are gonna, oh, give you. Casella Brunetti is caused, it's called, also called Q fever. Another intracellular parasite related to the Rickettsia ACI family, harbored by a wide assortment of vertebrates and arthropods. Right. Usually they're gonna tell you it's milk. Um, it can be transmitted in uh, urine, feces, and droplets. Right. If someone is sneezing or whatever, it, they, they can transmit it. Usually inhaled causing pneumonia, fever, and hepatitis. So if you ever see Q fever, this is the organism, and they're usually going to tell you it's transmitted by uh, milk, or they were in some area, and the only thing that, that you know they consume milk or something. So I'm going to give you some kind of case study like that. All right, let's talk a little bit about chlamydia. 
So small gram negative, another obligate intracellular parasite. So remember, this is something you also can't get from toilet seats or casual contact. Uh, it is one of those that you can get from sharing uh, latex toys. Right? It can be done, but not that common. Now, the cool thing about this, or the different thing about this, or something you know they would test you on, they're always gonna test you on, like how would you differentiate one thing from the other from the other? What's specific about it? Um, these have an elementary body right here. Small metabolically inactive. All right, so they're just kind of like the cyst or the uh, endospore. These are not active. They want to be consumed by something so they can, they can become active and start reproducing. These are extracellular, medically inactive. They're, extra, they're not inside of a cell. Remember, these are obligate intracellular parasites. They have to find a host. Um, form released uh, by the infected host. So this person is releasing this um, either through um, you know seminal fluid or you know some kind of mucus um, mucus uh, substance to the other person so this is going to be person to person contact all right <clears throat> so it enters inside of the, the host the the cell consumes it it's inside the host it's going to start um, so I'm going to macrophage or phagocytosis inside of the cell. It starts reproducing. It turns into a reticular body. Right? Non-infectious at this point because it's inside of a cell. Right? <clears throat> Actively dividing form grows within the host cell vacuoles. Then it gets released, releases the um, elementary bodies. And this is how we reinfect the next person down the chain. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? Kind of? So, you know, this is the elementary body, this is your host cell. So let's just say this is mucus or seminal fluid or something that is inside your body. So this is usually transmitted to a mucous membrane, which is outside your body. So it could be, um, you know, throat, nasal cavity, GI tract, um, reproductive tract or something. So it's entering your body through some kind of mucous membrane. It gets phagocytosed inside the body. All right, here's the elementary bodies. They, they get in here. They start reproducing through binary fission. They mature, they get released, and now it's in your fluid or wherever, and you expel it out to the next person. <clears throat> All right, trichomonas or trachomonas. Chlamydia, this causes severe conjunctiva or conjunctivitis, or you guys might know it as pink eye, right? Human reservoir and two strains can infect humans. Trachoma attacks the mucous membranes of the eyes, dental urinary tract, and the lungs. Ocular trachoma, severe infection, deforms eyelids, cornea, may cause blindness. All right, so back in the day when soft contacts first came out in the very late 70s, early 80s, um, this was a big thing because we didn't have a lot of the disinfection systems out there or the, the saline solutions we have now. So this was a big thing and it would literally um, grow on contacts for a short period of time and then it would uh, infect the eye. Or it was if somebody had it on their eye and they wore contacts, it would irritate this and these things would start growing and they get into the mucous membrane and cause conjunctiva. Conjunctiva. All right. Inclusive conjunctivus occurs in babies as it passes through the birth canal, prevented by a prophylactics, and they still use silver nitrate, as far as I know. All right. Secondary, secondary, uh, most prevalent STD, so chlamydia, you've heard of this, can cause uh, inflammation of the uh, ureters, cervix, salpinges, um, pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, and scarring. Is this is going to be passed from, uh, you know, whatever sexual activity, male to male, female to female, male to female, whatever, you know, whatever is going on. All right. So human reservoir and there's two strains can affect the humans. Trachoma, which you just saw, attacks the mucous membrane of the eyes, central urinary tract, and the lungs. This is probably the most common. So just remember, it's going to attack any kind of a mucous membrane. 
lymphogranuloma venereum. All right, so this is extremely, this is definitely a venereal disease. It affects the lymph nodes, all right? And if you look down here, can you see this guy's lymph nodes down here, inguinal lymph nodes, all right? Disfiguring disease of external genitalia and pelvic um, lymphatics. That's the scorching case right there. Okay, and we're also finding there's new ones out there now that can actually cause pneumonia, all right? So remember, this can affect any kind of mucous membrane. If it affects the, na uh, the nose or the back of the throat and it's, it's swallowed. And remember, I kind of said before, pneumonia is not uh, that common. You don't really just get it. You probably have to have uh, some kind of nasal issue or a respiratory issue where the lung tissue is very inflamed. Now you, you, know, you swallow a few of these or they get uh, aspirated into your lungs and they start going through binary fission, getting into the alveolar. It can cause atypical pneumonia that is serious in asthma patients. And you guys remember anything about asthma or know anything about asthma, with asthma, those bronchioles constrict. <clears throat> so they have trouble getting air in and air out. So if they have pneumonia and they can get, can't get air in or air out, they have a really uh, hard time getting oxygen to become hypoxic very, very easily. Okay, patetia, if you ever see this word, all right, this is always caused by birds. All right, so orthonosis, <clears throat> a zoonotic transmitted to humans from bird vectors, highly communicable among all birds. So it is very, very zoonotic, but we can become incidental host for this. All right, Pneumo uh, pneumonia and flu-like in infection with fever and lung congestion. And this was also one of those things in the late 70s, early 80s, um, or mid 80s, even when HIV and AIDS was new. Another one of those um, diseases that uh, they were showing up that didn't make any sense, it was zoonotic in birds. But remember these people with HIV, um, their CD4 cells were so uh, diminished that their immune system wasn't up and functioning. So this uh, became a, a common causing pneumonia, a lot of respiratory symptoms that just didn't make any sense because it was really only um, zoonotic and, and mostly in birds. All right, talk a little bit here about some dental diseases. All right. If you guys remember uh, one of the major things that causes dental cavities that we talked about? No? Okay, so strep, mutans, viridans, these are usually ones that cause um, dental caries. But remember, in your mouth, I told you guys before, there's like 500, the book says four, but there's usually more like 500 different species of bacteria in your mouth. Right, so the oral cavity is complex. It's a dynamic ecosystem containing 400 different species. So remember, this causes biofilms. The first layer is going to start fermenting all those carbohydrates in your teeth. It's going to change the acidity. It's going to lower the acidity. All right. It's also going to change the pH. And then as these things start consuming that and excreting stuff, it changes the entire environment. So we have more and more different types of bacteria growing on top of each other, making many, many layers. All right. But the first layer, or the first couple layers are going to start um, fermenting their carbohydrates and they release acid, it makes it very, very acidic. It starts um, eroding that um, calcium and the enamel in your, in your teeth. So we have your tooth surface, which is enamel, the root, with the pellicle formation, um, acidification, dental caries start, starts destroying the teeth. Remember, it's also destroying the, the gums, all right? gingivitis and root reabsorption, all right? And gums usually don't grow back that easy. And um, gum transplants are not a lot of fun. They literally have to go in, they have to cut the roof of your mouth for a graft, right? And, and sew it on there. And it is beyond extremely painful. You have to wear like a little um, very thin retainer type thing because they literally, it's bleeding and that's raw. So even if your tongue touches it, it makes it much, much worse. So keep your gums, keep your, all your teeth if you can. All right, is anyone here taking calculus? No. <laughs> yeah, 
I, I don't recommend it. I took uh, Kelk 1 and 2. Uh, Kelk 3 took me out. I left. All right. So calculus is very, very hard. All right. But this is also, calculus is extremely hard. It's tartar. All right. And you're all going to come across patients who look like they haven't brushed their teeth since they were born. All right. So this is stuff they have literally have to scrape off your teeth. Okay. So it's going to show you here, like, um, there's going to be a picture coming up of like layer one, layer two, layer three. And as these biofilms attach, they, like I said, they change the environment and everything. Um, and each form is a little bit different. And the problem with these biofilms, I said before, as you have five or six layers, even if we were to brush our teeth or get something in there, we have to get past all those layers to get to the basement membrane of this. So it begins with a colonization of slime forming species like Streptococcus, Mutans, Viridans, we talked about some of these. Cross adherence with the Cidiomyces, process form layer of thick adherent material plaque that harbors masses of bacteria that produce acid then they start dissolving your enamel. And if you don't brush your teeth or keep up with it, if plaque is allowed to stay, secondary invaders appear, lactobacillus, bacteroides, um, there's your little syphilis coming in there. All right. Acid dissolves tooth enamel, leads to caries and tooth damage. And yeah. <clears throat> so here, if you trace all this back, we have like our first layer, second layer, changes everything. Now we have a third layer, fourth layer, our fifth layer. So now we have all these biofilms. So we've all brushed our teeth, you know, hopefully a few times this week already. And as you brush your teeth, they feel relatively clean, but by noon or one or wherever, you get that feeling of that slime layer, the pellicle, that issue. That's all the bacteria that's, that's growing. Um, it's, you know, it's going through binary fission, growing and adhering to your teeth. And then each layer, we have another layer growing on top of that, and another layer growing on top of that, and on top of that. And you know, people that don't brush their teeth every day or twice a day or whatever, this is gonna become um, much more problematic for them, right? And right now, like all my friends that are dentists or dental hygienists and stuff, they're saying that they can't even keep up with all the people who missed their appointments, you know, March, April, May, and June. So they're just mobbed. So people, you know, are, sidebar people are really trying to get their teeth clean right and this is just kind of showing you um <clears throat> what can happen with gum disease so it just starts evading the teeth and it's just working its way down here and you know i don't know if you guys know but once your tooth fractures or once there's damage in here you know you can get a you know if you have a damage to your teeth they can do a root canal they can pull the roots out so you don't feel the pain but that's only temporary at some point in time, they literally have to either remove the, they'll remove the teeth, tooth, they'll put a titanium post in here, and then we can, you know, put um, implants, permanent implants in here. But um, sometimes it's extremely painful and extremely expensive to have done. They're about three to four thousand dollars a piece. And I think that's it. All right. <clears throat> All right, you guys had enough for tonight? Do you want to go on? Yeah. Your call. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. We can start at 22 if you want on my COSIs, or you know, we, we can end here and we'll pick it up on Thursday. It's up to you. Oh, yeah, Thursday. <laughs> all right, all right, that's fine. Yeah, okay. It's not like it was Thursday. <laughs> No, it's all right. We get an hour, so I will um, stop this now. I'll record this. I'll upload it for you guys, and then uh, we'll pick it up Thursday um, around five or five ten. So I think use the same link, the same link. If not, I will just pop it into the uh, email and announcements like I did tonight. But this went. No, no major problem. So I think I finally figured it out towards the very, very end. All right, guys, thanks for joining me. Thanks for answering my questions. If you have any more questions, email me. All right.
right, thanks. All right, have a good night. You too. Thanks, Dr. Phil, you too. All right, bye guys.